viewers, we are back on track to discuss the seventh and the final video, I mean final for now, on the Exalted Kingdom Church. We started on Monday and the idea is to produce in video teaching form what the Lord is given as a theological, the biblical basis rather, of this assignment he's calling his kingdom church to. And men and brethren, we talked about the identity of the church in the series. And if you understand the identity of the church, then you embrace the mandate of the church. And when you know the identity and the mandate, then you give yourself over for the Lord's purpose to be done. As I was saying, by the grace of the Lord, life in the kingdom is not about us. We are nothing. Life in the kingdom is about he who owes us by creation, owes us by redemption. He determines what he wants to do through each and every one of us. So otherwise, we'll be running on ambitions if you are planning what you do. No, Yeshua said, I didn't come from heaven to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me and to finish it. Please make sure you give us feedback. If there's enough sound, let us know. If there's a sound issue, let us know. And we need to know because we had tried this before and there was no sound. So we've got to understand what's going on. The Lord wants the church to know that in the 4th century, something of epic proportion happened to the church. And what is it? The church was tackled by the devil and the church slid out of the way. It missed the essence of the gospel of the kingdom. And it took on Christian religion. The church ceased to be an agency of the kingdom, became an agency of the world. The church lost its head, lost its suitor, Yeshua Jesus, and the church received a new suitor, the Roman Empire. The church move from being an organic kingdom entity in the atrium to become a religious organization you join. It became an organization that was about building, an organization that had priestly caste, like the Old Testament people who wear special robes ministering to a, a dormant laity. The majority of people were dormant laity, and among that dormant laity, the women were discriminated against, the men were given a lot of opportunity to serve. And so that new visage of the church that fell out of the way has been what has operated from the 4th century to today. And if you don't know this, you wouldn't know where the problem came from. The truth is that in the 4th century, the church was tackled and fell out of the way. And brothers and sisters, that is why in spite of all the Revivals that happened, whether I'm talking about the one of Martin Luther, 1517, the one of John Knox, the one of the uh, various faith worthies of old. The one of the reasons why it didn't become universal was that they were trying to reform something that was inherently defective. And so while Holy Spirit will come upon specific people and do things, the church at large had never really taken time to understand the identity of the church as in the Holy Scripture and the universality of that identity. And that's why we need to say this, in every generation, Elohim preserved a remnant. Even in that fourth century, there were those Elohim preserved. They were not part of that marriage of church and Rome. And every generation he preserves. And the unique feature of the last reformation before the Lord returns, is that he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. It's not going to be about a priestly case. It's not going to be about a person. It's going to be a movement of Elohim's people. Some call it the saints movement. Others call it the priesthood of all believers. For want of any other word, you can call it the Melchizedek priesthood. That will arise in the end time. They will arise, not intimidated, by what they see of the world, not intimidated by what they see of Satan's work in the earth rim, in nature, in other circumstances. They know that Satan comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. They know that. They understand that. They are not intimidated by anything because their church will begin to dig deep into the Holy Scriptures, be open to Holy Spirit, who will show the church who she is, 
what is invested in her and the assignment and that church is what we call the exalted kingdom church and brothers and sisters everything in life obeys the law of identity if you know your identity and embrace your identity everything will fall into place for instance what is the identity of the church we said the other day that Satan wants to give the church an image of a weak, helpless entity, wherein people are just in quarrel and quarrel and strife and offense and all that, all that. The energy is sapped. Satan wants the church to be filled with weakness and weaknesses and being unable to see the glory of the world to come, being unable to see what the Lord says of it. The Lord says to the remnant, if you continue looking down, you're going to be trapped in down. But he says, look up. Look up for your redemption draws near. And what does he want us to look up to see? He wants us to see what he sees of this church in this end time. Yes. Ephesians chapter 5. Look at what the Lord says. Husbands in verse 25. Love your wives even as Yeshua also loved his church and gave himself for it. Take note, 2, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. So the Lord is telling us something here. He's giving up a sneak peek into how he sees the end time church, the church that will overcome the entrapment of union with Rome, the church that will overcome the entrapment of mystery Babylon, because mystery Babylon that John the Beloved saw in the book of Revelation, which he spoke in a figure about, he saw what will happen in the fourth century. John was the only one that lived towards the end of the first century. You see, the book of Revelation was downloaded about AD 95 to 97. So let's say John lived to see the end of the century. Only him. And listen to this. He saw that a day will come when this same Roman government that made sure Yeshua was crucified through Pontius Pilate, that same empire that tried to stamp out that, that tried to stamp out the gospel and didn't succeed and will not succeed, that a day will come when it will try to marry the church. And John saw in the book of Revelation what he called Mystery Babylon. And Mystery Babylon, for those who wonder what is Mystery Babylon, go and check the image of a woman riding on a beast. So what is it? It's a union of church and state. John saw that that union will happen when the Roman Empire, after it had tried to stamp out the gospel through various ways and not succeeding, it would prefer to go and get into cahoots with the church, marry the church, so to say, so that through that marriage, and you cannot marry a woman whose husband is still around, he had to first kick off the husband of the church, Yeshua, marry the church, and then will the church begin to rule the world to expand this kingdom. You know the story. In AD 476, the Roman Empire collapsed. Okay? The western part, the eastern part, based in Constantinople, lasted another thousand years, and then it was gone. Today, the entire eastern part, the great eastern part of the Roman Empire, is the Islamic Republic of Turkey that produced the Ottoman Empire. But then the church it married is still here. <clears throat> and now listen, most times people tend to focus much on the Catholic Church as an entity, but that's besides the point. That's not the point. The point that the law was revealing to Paul is that a time will, uh, to John was that this kind of state union of church and state is going to be part of the end of the age. And I want to say this to you. What happened in the fourth century will be repeated in the last century before Yeshua returns. The Protestant wing of the church that arose from 1517 is going to be in cahoots with governments so that what will happen is the same thing that happened in the fourth century. And most times people will be 
reaching the church in terms of that organizational church that is in union between church and state. And listen to this. The mystery Babylon is going to be the key to understand how the Antichrist will emerge. And I'm going to go and say much about it. But to say to you, listen to this. The formal organized church will produce the Antichrist. If you look at everything the Bible teaches on the Antichrist, you discover the balance of all that it says is not going to come from a stranger element like another religion. It's only going to come from outside churchianity. So churchianity will produce the Antichrist, who held the Antichrist as the very savior of the church. And that's enough to say for now. But what I want to say this to you is that Yeshua was telling us that don't be too latched into all that Satan is doing and what he's trying to do to corrupt the church. Yeshua when he went to heaven, he called the master planner, the master builder of the church, Paul the Apostle, and began to download into him one day, and Paul documented it in Ephesians 5, what we have just read. So the master builder that the Lord called for himself showed us a picture of his own church, the remnant church, the one there's no geographical divisions. You know, today's Arise online service, we had Teacher Akwasi from UK, we had Apostle John from Ireland, we have Apostle Dennis Sharp from Tennessee. Different backgrounds, but the same truth. The same truth that we're saying from different perspectives. The, listen to this. The Church of Yeshua is not organizational. It's not locational. There are two tribes on earth at the end of the day. Two races upon earth. The redeemed of the Lord who are pressed into him and are his remnants, and we have those who are outside the kingdom. And so the Lord wants us to know that concerning the church he's going to return for, because he's surely coming. Behold, he comes. He says, watch, pray, occupy. What is that church? Number one, he loved the church to the degree he gave his life for it. You've got to understand what that means. That Yeshua shed his blood so that the church will come into being. That we come into being as his bride because he shed his blood. So his blood is the bride price with which he activated the church in the earth realm. So that means the church is not ordinary. This church that the Antichrist will not be able to deceive, this Christ that human beings will not be able to sidetrack, this church of people that it doesn't, is not a, a numbers game, is not about membership role, is not about tight card, this church that is within the church of whom he alone knows, the Lord knows those who are part of that church. Number one thing he wants to say is that he loves the church to the degree he gave his life for it. Very profound. Number two, he says in that same passage, verse 26, that he is cleansing and sanctifying the church with the water of the word. That's ongoing. The church, he didn't just procure it with his blood. He knew that without the full understanding of his purpose in the word, people are going to read the scriptures denominationally, religiously, self-centeredly, and so he says he's going to release his anointing upon his word, and it will carry the potency that will cleanse the church of all filthiness of cultural blinders, religious blinders, so we can understand his church the way he understands it. So he's cleansing and sanctifying his church with the water of the word. That's why here now, that's what is going on. There are those who will be delivered of some things they didn't know of by the time this is over. There are people who will get some insight, some understanding that they didn't have before. So that's number two thing the Lord wants us to know about the church is returning for. Number three, the state of the church at the end of the age is explicitly stated. He calls it a glorious church. And so we need to ask ourselves, are we part of that glorious church? The church within the church, not the organization, not the crowd, not the, not the numbers known by men. Are we part of that church? Then he says it's without, he says it's a glorious church 
then he calls it radiant. Look at it again. If you check very well, in that verse 27, he says, he might present it to himself a glorious church. Glorious, radiant, so spectacular. Then he went on to talk about things about it. He says, not having spot. What does it mean? Spot stands for sin. Spots of sin. So it's not going to be a church that is spotted with sin. Sin racked. Sin everywhere. Struggling. Two. He says, without, he says, without spots, then without wrinkle. Wrinkle. What does wrinkle mean? Traditions of men. Denominational traditions. So that the world is no longer the world. People look at it from different angles. Wrinkles. Traditions of men. Dogmas of men, things that you can easily use to take away the truth of the word and make the word of no effect. Those things are wrinkles, okay? Because wrinkles stand for age. So with time, the age and they are seen to be not what he wants. Then he says, again, it shall be free of other things. With, you know, he says, and any such thing or any such thing. What are the other such things? The other such things you can easily point out that they mean anything that kind of beclouds the glory of the church. What are they? Poverty mentality in the mind. What are they? Offenses when they choke up the, 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 the good seed inside. Weaknesses free of sorrow. And trampled on the foot of men, which is happening today almost all over the world. You see, church leaders are chasing those in authority. It doesn't matter what they do. They want to be near to authority. They want to be seen in photograph with those in government. And for that reason, they embrace everything happens. This is not one thing. You might say, oh, hey, I, can, I can see that in my country. It's a universal thing. Without savor. Trampled on their foot. Being played around like football. Some leaders take they take one million, they give to church leaders, they quarrel about it, they scramble, scramble to make the money, and they are, he says, no. That thing that made the church able to be, you know, stamped upon by government is going to take about it, take it out. Then powerlessness. Church without power, without ability to change things, he says the church is coming for, will be holy without blemish, holy, consecrated to him totally, totally free of consecration to any other thing, and totally consecrated to him, holy, radiant, glorious. So, men and brethren, that is the church. He is vested with those equipments we told you during the week, including the authority of the name of Yeshua, at which all knees shall bow, the power of the shed blood, by which Satan is nullified. Satan's activity anywhere is nullified. The power of Holy Spirit with which to be ambassadors to go and reconcile the lost to him and all the other things we share with you during the week. Don't forget them. Watch the videos. Those equipments are still important. Now the question is how do we apply those equipments to the work of the spiritual cabinet the Lord has called us to? Number one, the Lord wants us to remember that the church is a stakeholder of the earth realm. You see, most times religion tends to paint a misunderstanding of some scriptures when they say like we're strangers and pilgrims. So the religious part of the church wants to paint it all. Oh, for that reason, we are not supposed to be involved. Let's just, let's just count our days and the time comes, death or rapture, we go. So whatever happens, let them, we, we can't be bothered. It doesn't concern us. Then the other wing, the pseudo kingdom movement, the false prophetic movement, we might say, no, no, let's live about this heaven, heaven, heaven thing. Let's, we are to climb the mountains and take over everything now, now, now. And these two extremes are wrong. We go to the Bible, we see what the Lord says. He says from Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 29, that Elohim created man for the purpose of exercising dominion over the earth realm. Take note. There's a difference between walls, as we told you, and the earth. The earth is this physical mass you see on the map. The world are the systems of life on it. 
So there's a world of darkness ruled by Satan, and there is the world of the kingdom, the kingdom sphere that is ruled by Yeshua himself. So the Lord made the church. We should not play ignoramus. We should not play indifference. There's a sin called indifference. We are stakeholders of the earth realm. Why? Psalm 24 tells us that the earth is lost and the fullness thereof. Okay? So if it is so, then Psalm 115 verse 16 tells us that the heaven, even the heaven are the lost, the earth he has given to the sons of men. And because of that, the Lord says, we have a stake. While we are here, the church, the kingdom church, cannot be indifferent, cannot be unconcerned about what goes on, the corruption in government, the, the political, uh, you know, uh, uh, bullfights and that everywhere is charged up. The church cannot be indifferent and say it doesn't concern us. The church has a stake in this earth realm to be representatives of the, of, of the Father in the earth realm. Number two, the church is the ambassador of the kingdom of heaven in the earth realm. You know, it's important you know. You see, the kingdom is going to be forever. The church has a scope in the earth realm. It represents the kingdom and it will fulfill itself when it's reconciled with its head, Yeshua. So, while we are here, we are ambassadors of the kingdom and we are to preserve the earth realm from corruption of the world system. And that means our own sphere. There's a sphere the Lord has given to me and you and to everybody. That sphere, don't be indifferent to it. Family, where he planted you anywhere, begin to see it as your sphere of influence. Begin to see your neighborhood. Begin to see the community as a sphere of influence that through prayer and through other things, some of them we've spoken about, about good deeds, that we can begin to show them what heaven looks like. And then it can affect them and make them more open to the gospel. So we are, you know, to be... We are not to be isolated. That's why Yeshua prayed the Father in John 17. He said, Father, I'm not asking you to take them out of this world. Preserve them from the evil one. Yours they are. Keep them in your own name, whom you gave to me, so that they will finish the work I sent them to do. So the Lord prayed for our preservation from the influence of the prince of the poor of the air. Like he said in John 14, 30, the prince of this world cometh and finds nothing in me. Because of what? Hold it within. Hold it without. There's nothing. I don't have any of this property. I don't have any. I'm not selfish, self-centered. I am the Father. I'm his born servant doing his will. So also he says that we should do. Number three, on behalf of Yeshua, who is the head of all principality and power, as Colossians tells us, we are to carry the governments of this world on the shoulder through prayer and spiritual warfare. Now, you need to know, in Isaiah 16, Isaiah 9, he says in verse 6, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Now, take note, children are born, sons are given. Many people are born children, but they have not received the spirit of sonship. Spirit of sonship, how do you know you got it? Whenever you come to the place where the most potent thing that determines everything you do is the leading of Holy Spirit. Romans 8.14 as many as are led by the Holy Spirit, they are who the sons of God. And so, whenever you come to that place, you pay the price, you come to the place where Holy Spirit determines everything. Even if you got a bad name by men and people think anything of you, but every single thing you think, say, and do is by His leading. And His leading is not grievous, but it's not always convenient. And it leads you to Deaths, it leads you first to the wilderness, like Yeshua was led by Holy Spirit to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Have you ever considered that? And so, when you come to that place, he says, A son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty Elohim, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Those who denounce the divinity of Yeshua, they've not read the scripture. That, but look at what the Lord revealed to us in the course of this thing. 
that when he says the government shall be upon his shoulder, you discover that the Bible says that Yeshua is the head and we are the body. If it is so, we are his shoulder. So the things he will carry in this phase, this part of eternity, before he returns to rule and reign over this earth for a thousand years from Jerusalem, the millennial reign, before then, while we are on this side of the rapture, what he wants to do in the earth realm, he wants to do it through us. He wants to do it through us. So we say the government shall be upon our shoulder. If we are, you know, truly the who the church ought to be, the governments of this world, we don't need to run around them. They want to run to curry our favor. We don't need to be running around them to make that policy, to make that policy. We can actually determine what happens. So that's why First Timothy chapter 2, Paul says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Take note of that. For all men. Everybody on earth has a fundamental right to hear the gospel. Everybody on earth has a fundamental right to have a presentation of Yeshua, a solution to sin. Everyone has a right to hear. And what they do with what they hear is their business. So to pray for them. And then he says, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Then verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority. That we should pray, supplication, prayers, intercession, giving of thanks be made also for those that are in authority. In other words, government upon our shoulder, we should take everything about them and present it to the Father in heaven. And that includes their hearts, their human beings, their spirit, soul, and body. Their spirit man is Elohim. After all, it came from him. The day he withdraws it, they are gone. The office they are sitting, he gave it to them. They have emotion, they have memories, they have mind, they can process, they have imagination, they can, they can see all these things about them. By prayer and by spiritual warfare, we can lay hold of those things and put it in the hand of the Father. According to Proverbs 21, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he turns it any way he wants. You see, because the church has not stepped into these things, that's why the church has been cast under foot to be trodden by men, by the various governments of the world. Because when ministers are running around government, they depreciate the worth of the church to those that are running around. He says, why do we need to pray for them that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty? Elohim has not sent us to fight people whether you like them or not. You not yeah, there's no basis for going to attack them in the public sphere. There's also no basis, on the other hand, of for you to be their lap dog, repeating whatever they say, what they said today, uh, yesterday, today is your sermon. That's a mess. A terrible mess. And that's what church leaders are doing. Using talking points of political parties. When we do that, we have reversed the trend. They should use our talking points. Not we using their talking points. And brothers and sisters, the remnant church is rising. The remnant church is shaking off the dust. The remnant church is going to be glorious. And part of that work of this uh, prayer and spiritual cabinet is to recapture these truths and to enforce them like sons of Elohim. He says that we may live a quiet and peaceful life in all goodness and honesty. You can't say what about government doesn't concern. It concerns you. Look at what has happened in the UK about the grading of exams. It concerns everybody. Born again, not born again. So what do we do? Do we carry placard like others? No. We go to the place of prayer. We pray and pray knowing that we have access to our Father. And he who has the heart of kings and princes, if the things need to be reversed, he will reverse them. If it is going to work together for the good of his children who are, who are just coming up in life, and we don't know some of these things, he will say, let it go. Let it go. Brothers and sisters, he said we should live a quiet and peaceful life. The Lord wants us to know that while we are here, we can literally lay hold and determine how people live, how people in authority behave. They can be moderated through prayer, through spiritual warfare. Things can happen. Brothers and sisters, it's a shame that the church world refuses to engage in this space. So you have magicians, you have occultists taking on the space the church refused to operate in, making their incantations. Nowadays, 
openly. Many years ago, it's difficult to see anything about witchcraft. Nowadays, they go to fairs, they take stands, they come, come and cast a spell at your enemy. I mean, spells are now publicly sold in many Western countries because the church, while men slept, the enemy went to do his work. While the church went away from the space, evil doers, agents of Satan occupied it. The Lord said, now it's time to reverse it. We're going to get engaged in this fair because this earth, we have a stake here. Yes, our life is temporary for now, but we are going to rule over this earth when Yeshua returns. So we cannot allow it to just go ahead to be nothing. So that is why, number four, the Lord wants us to know that he also left us on earth. We've discussed it before to complete the gospel of the kingdom, which he started. Let me show you something about the gospel of the kingdom for you to know. That we have to be open to manifestations of signs and wonders. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, from that time, Yeshua began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The gospel of the kingdom is the very first message Yeshua preached. This is his first message during the three and a half years. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was a gospel message. Where well, repentance? Repentance is in the heart. A change of heart. Have a change of heart. That's where the king wants to come and dwell and be our boss, our leader. Brothers and sisters, when you understand that, you understand the things about the gospel of the kingdom. Verse 18, Yeshua walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. He said unto them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Verse 20, And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Take note of that. The gospel of the kingdom, when it is preached, the king of the kingdom makes a demand on people, and we're told that straight away, everything was secondary to their following him. Brothers and sisters, we must come to that place where our following him is not 80% of our heart to him, the other 20% we retain. Not 90%, not 95 not 99 Every degree of our heart of our will that we retain is an idol. The gospel of the kingdom demands allegiance to the king of kings. They followed him. Verse 21. And going from thence, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nests, and he called them. 22. They immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. It's all immediately. Immediately. The word of the king supervenes over every other word. Now today, because of the way the gospel has been so messed up, you know, there are people who are fearful about the call of the Lord. They don't want a call. Let me go and make money first. Let me build. Let me marry. Let me have children. All those things. And that's the way it's been presented. What people don't know is that if the Lord calls you, he determines what he does with you according to his determinate counsel. And when you say, yes, Lord, if his call is that he wants you to be a millionaire like Joseph of Arimantia, have access to those in authority, he was a disciple. Peter and John, they required them to drop all so that they would be full-time with him because of the assignment. Nicodemus didn't have to. Nicodemus still had his work in the high council of Israel. Joseph of Arimantia had his access to Pont uh, 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 Pontius Pilate, he had access to the Roman authorities, and he had ability to build his own tomb so that he can fulfill prophecy. Process, and let's not try to determine what the Lord will do with us. Let's learn to say, yes, Lord, when he calls us. If you are not yet submitted to the king, even if we're in church, but if the king doesn't have first charge, and we have not come to that place where his voice is authority, his voice is authoritative, and we can find various ways to try to whittle down his word to make it of non effect, then we have not known the gospel of the kingdom. We may have known religion, but not the gospel of the kingdom, because it's about the primacy of the king, whose word settles everything. Immediately they followed him. Then we're still in verse 23. Yeshua went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing 
all manner of sicknesses and all manner of disease among the people. This didn't mean that all of them repented, but he went about doing good. Because a few verses earlier, in Matthew chapter 3, Holy Spirit came upon him. He went about all Syria, and they brought him all sick people, and they that were checking with diverse diseases and torments, and they were possessed with devils, which were lunatic, and those that had a palsy, he healed them. Everything was settled by him, and followed him great multitudes of people in Galilee, and Decapolis, from Jerusalem, from Judea, from beyond Jordan. So he went about manifesting the power of the kingdom. And when the power of the kingdom is manifested, everything of darkness gives way. Whether it's sickness, whether it's disease, whether it is poverty, everything gives way to the power of the kingdom, the authority of the king. And that is part of the thing the Lord wants us now. In number five, we've talked about uh, four things to complete the gospel of the kingdom. Number five, to exercise governmental authority over the natural realm. The Lord is saying to his church, this must be recovered, the power of Holy Spirit, with which to recover governmental authority when we are praying. We can legislate the natural realm from the spiritual. And the natural realm includes governments and those in authority, includes natural, natural disasters and you know, issues of weather, climate change, whatever things that are happening, the natural gun crime, knife crime, Whatever things, tension in the land, whatever they are, the church can, in prayer and spiritual warfare, can redeem the land, can determine what happens. The healthcare system of the kingdom, which is the power of healing and power of deliverance, can be deployed to touch lives so that people will know that the church of Yeshua is indeed supernatural. So it means that the Lord excise, expects us to exercise governmental authority. And you can't exercise if you do not know. You can't exercise if you do not expect. Expectation is the model of manifestation. The days of just being satisfied with going to a building on certain holidays to jump up and down and do some things is gone. you got to come to the place of expecting the Lord by His Spirit to order your feet to where you'll be a solution provider in the life of thing, of, of men. And if it is so, then the kingdom church is time to exercise governmental authority. And that's part of what the prayer spiritual cabinet is all about. That the prayer spiritual cabinet shall begin to do the work of the Lord, represent him in the earth realm, until the time when he comes to take the church home. To take the church home. Until that time. Let me reiterate some of the things that the kingdom church should do. Nation to nation, prayer and spiritual cabinets have been set up. And we say to you, type prayer and spiritual cabinet form. Then put the name of your nation. If it doesn't come up, just get back to us. But if it comes up, you apply to be part of it. And we don't want it to be everywhere. It's not right to be everywhere because you're a human being. There's a limit to what you can do. You can be in the one for where you are situated and the one for where you are assigned. So, two is okay. Don't be more than two. Don't be that you are going to hunt for relationship or you're going to hunt for, you know, uh, contacts. No, there's something happening. Many people in the kingdom don't know about faithfulness. The Lord connects you to something, you take your place. So that that thing, that place you take, the enemy can never cross there. But some people are here and there, and the process of being here and there, whatever is committed to their hand, it slips off. People are just opportunists. Opportunism is not kingdom. Opportunism is of the world. The kingdom is a faithful kingdom. You take your place. You are there. You are part of it. You are not just trying to use people to get what you want and to go and achieve whatever is your own ambition. No. The kingdom is a kingdom of responsibility. And the Father... Just as we are 12 tribes of Israel, and when Yeshua came, he called 12 people. Why didn't he call only John, his intimate friend? He called 12. Why, why didn't God say, just Jacob, I deal with you? 12 tribes of Israel. Why? Because the Lord, in the governance of his kingdom, he allows what we call kingdom tribes, networks, connections, relationships. 
where you find your place, you can touch lies and lies can touch you and they are built up and the Lord uses you collectively and you don't trust at each other, you don't play games, you don't take a, a, a sword or spear to you know trust at somebody where you can be honest and sincere, accounted, accountable and where you can give yourself to others and others to you and everybody by what every joint is supplying, the body can make it increase of itself in love. Whenever I see someone is flotsam and jutsam, no particular place you can see that person connected, involved, faithful, something is wrong. And brothers and sisters, for those who are going to be part of this global kingdom movement, the Lord says, number one, he wants a group of people who in a nation are going to, by prayer and spiritual warfare, they are going to rebuild 40 foundations of the nations by repentance. Psalm 11 verse 3. Let the foundation be destroyed. What shall the righteous do? The righteous can by prayer and repentance rebuild faulty foundations. Whether it's blood guiltiness, whether it was gross wickedness, people came from another land, destroyed the people in the land, took over everything, took over their wives and children, took over their lands and dispossessed them. That's a wicked foundation. It needs to be prayed into. You can't do much about the past, but by prayer, and tears and cries unto the Lord, you can, you know what? Pre 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 prevent the speaking of blood and the speaking of lies that was contact in the course of building the modern nation. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, spiritual warfare, we can rebuild foundations of nations by repentance. Psalm 11 verse 3. Number two, we can redeem polluted thrones of authority at national state and city levels. Most thrones of authority, we've said this and we can keep saying it, most thrones of authority are polluted. Some were established with animal sacrifices, some with human sacrifices. Some, you see a king's throne or a governor's throne or a president's throne, they killed seven men. Some killed seven women who were virgins because of what their witch doctor told them to establish their throne. And that's why there's such a, a thick cloud around that throne and people do policies that cannot ever profit people, only profits those in authority. There's so much wickedness about certain thrones. And if you don't deal with them, some of them were established by somebody killed a man in authority and took over his throne. If you don't deal with these foundations, wickedness can always come from that altar. Number three. Through repentational, representational repentance for sins of the nation, saints should be able to do that. Everything in a nation, corruption, all kinds of evil, all kinds of gun crime, knife crime, all kinds of things going on in the country, the church, and not everybody, because it is everybody. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 13 and 14, see, even if evil comes upon a land, Locusts, whatever they are, if my people, which are called by my name, that's the remnant, shall humble themselves to pray, to seek my face, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, I will heal their land. So it doesn't matter, even if there's no other person in a country, only you, and you are crying to the Lord for the evil of your land, Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 1 says, look through and through the street of Jerusalem, if you can find one person, I'll pardon her. One person. Ezekiel 22, 30 says, And I sought for a man who will stand in the gap, who will make up the hedge, that I will not destroy them, and I found none. One person can make a difference. The more so when you have two people praying. So if in your own country, the only two of you don't say it's only two, oh, where are the numbers? If these two are connected to heaven, for your sake, the Lord can have mercy on your nation. Remember, it was because of Abraham. God had mercy on his nephew, Lot. He prayed until Lot, he guarant God guaranteed that Lot will not be destroyed before he stopped praying. Brothers and sisters, where two or three are gathered in the name of the Lord, asking, they will get. Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. But where two or three, you know, it says, whatever two of you shall agree on earth, touching anything, it shall be granted them. So we can engage in representation. What does it mean by representational? Let me give you an instance. You know, certain things happened in my family lineage. And the time came, 
when I got to know this truth in 96 about, you know, thrones and kingdoms and some of these things about the kingdom, and I had to go to my village, go to the village, call the elders, thank the Lord. They were still alive. And led them to pray, representational prayers. In other words, we who were alive, taking responsibility and say, Lord, forgive the lead. Forgive our family. Forgive for this. Forgive for that. Forgive. We cried unto the Lord and prayed. And I'm glad I did it. And then when Pastor Grace came into my life, we also went on to pray another degree and other levels. And I can tell you that part of what we are doing now was possible because of those foundational restructuring. You need to restructure your foundation. If there are evil speaking, things are done. You know, we like to talk about assets. Nobody talks about liability. Let me remind you, many people have inherited assets of their great-grandparents. Your grandfather left the house. Your father had it as an inheritance. Your father has finished, died 10 years ago. He came to you. Okay, praise the Lord. You have a house in the city. It's any your money. Every month rent comes from there. You use it for sustenance. Have you ever asked yourself, supposing for any reason, that, great -grand that grandfather or great-grandfather actually went to a house, killed a man, looted his property, took his wife and all that, and that kind of evil was the foundation of that world. Was a highwayman broke into that bank in his time, in those days, war, wild west days, and all that, you got the asset, you know what, you also got the liabilities, you may not know it. So what does representational prayer do? It's simply about saying, Lord, whatever happened in my past, I now am a new creature. I have a relationship with you. And I stand on behalf of my lineage all the way to Adam. Anything that happened, whether we knew it or don't know it, but you knew it, it was open before you. I bring the minister of the blood upon those things. Whatever they are, we reject them. We refuse. We renounce them. We repent of them on behalf of my lineage. Father, have mercy. Forgive. That's the brothers and sisters. When you do this from your heart, you have excluded yourself. If others didn't want to do, that's their business. But for you and your house, you have procured for yourself. You know what? Your hand is washed. And if you're able to move your family to do this, that'd be wonderful. You have a family, you have influence in the family. Why not lead your family to go to deal with foundations of the family? Of the lineage. Brothers and sisters, representational repentance is part of what we're going to do for our cities, for our states, for our nations. So because when we talk about spiritual cabinet, it's not just the national, there's the national cabinet. So let's say in the U.S. you see brethren from Tennessee, Texas, Illinois, and all different states in the country will be in the cabinet for America, for instance. Then later, those from Texas should have the cabinet for Texas. Those in Killian, Houston, or, you know, uh, um, uh, Tex, um, um, Kilgo, those from Dallas, those from you know San Antonio, those from El Paso, all of them in the Texas one. Then when they finish, they put it to go. Those in Dallas should be able to have their Dallas cabinet to pray for things peculiar Dallas. So it's the way it's concentric circles. So we need to have representational prayer on behalf of our people. Number four, we need to commit hearts of those in authority. Lay hold of their heart, their mind, their will and emotion into the hand of Elohim to do his perfect will. Because there's something called the determinate counsel of Elohim, his will on earth. And some, uh, Proverbs 21 1 says, The heart of the king is the hand of the Lord. We who pray, we must pray with the consciousness that our prayer has effect. And listen to this. In the days of Elijah, or was it Elisha? Whatever was spoken by the king of Syria in his chamber, even bed chamber, Elisha will hear and warn the king of Judah and Israel. Brothers and sisters, Remember, in asymmetric spiritual warfare, we have actionable spiritual intelligence. Holy Spirit can still speak to us, can give us precision about laws, about contemplative plans, and we can pray about it. And when you have a cabinet, let's say there are 25 
top people in the executive branch, nine people in the uh, judiciary, and say hundred, hundreds of people in the legislative branch, like in this country, United Kingdom, there are 650 people in parliament, 300 and something in the House of Lords, and then you have the people in government, special advisors, all that. When we have enough intercessors, each one, will be each of these leaders, maybe five of them, ten of them, somebody will be over them praying that their heart will be sensitive. Their will will be sensitive to the will of Father. They will do His will. They will, they will. Whether they know it or not, they will end up doing His will. That means the church will stop being regressive, defensive. The church is going to go into the activist role of making sure that the government is upon its shoulder. So we've got to do that. Number five, the church, the spiritual cabinet, spiritual and prayer cabinet will be the midwife for the manifestation of the will of Elohim in the earth realm. Matthew 6, 10, the heart of the Lord's prayer is thy kingdom come that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the spiritual, the prayer and spiritual cabinet is a group of people who will be praying for the will of the Father to be done in all things in the geographic area we are praying. Number six, pray for the church and the nation to awake from sleep, arise from slumber, align, stop being divisive and confused, advance together to complete the great commission with fresh visitation of Holy Spirit. That's revival. Pray for heavy, great outpouring of Holy Spirit so that the church will get on with the great commission. It will become the central reason why the church is on earth again. And it shall do that with all zeal, according to Matthew 24, 14, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Acts 1, 8, Mark 16, 15 to 20. Number uh, six, six, we need to pray, and this is important again. Number six, we need to pray for, oh sorry, number seven this time. We need to pray for the church to recover the lost accent of holiness, love and unity. This is so important. Acts head. Holiness, holiness within, holiness. <laughs> you know, there are many things. There are rims of holiness. Over the years, I discovered there are rims of holiness. And the greatest rim is the rim where you are conscious that the kingdom is not meat and drink. It's righteousness, right standing with the Father. Peace, shalom, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so it doesn't matter what happens from the outside to you. For the kingdom's sake, don't internalize it. Forgive. Let go. Bless. Cost not. People curse you. Bless them. People abuse you. Find a way. When you're talking to the Father about them, you bring into the, the Father the attitude of the Lord. This is a superior level. This level, when we are there, you are checking yourself, you are concerned about your spiritual health, righteousness, Shalom, join the Holy Spirit. If you are going to be in the cabinet, you've got to go to this one. This is level one. You know, it's not talked about. Check all over the world. What they talk about is conflict resolution. All over the world. This one of whatever that happens, be like Yeshua. It doesn't matter what. Be the fool. They speak against evil. They say you don't know anything. You are not anointed as they are because they make a lot of what they call, you know, Oh, they call it Bole Kaja. You know, they do, and they say you don't do it. So, ah, that place is quiet. Forget it. Be the fool for the sake of the Lord. Just be the fool. No matter what. This is the level of holiness the Lord wants us to operate in. We're giving no offense in anything. And you are diligently knowing that Elohim is omniscient. He sees. He's omnipresent. He's always there. And it's omnipotent. And for that reason, we are not even looking to men, but to him. And because of that, purity in the heart and the mind and the will. These are the people that will see Elohim. We say, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see Elohim. This is where prayer becomes powerful. Because at this level, the Lord can use your vessel to do exponential things. And this is where the Lord wants us to be. You know, pray for the church to recover the lost access of holiness, of love, of unity, and be rapture ready. So that first Corinthians, first Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18, first Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11, first Corinthians 15, 
50 to 58 is a reality because the rapture is close by. As you are looking on the air trim, those of you who study the geopolitical system of the world know that certain currents are now in place. Those currents, if you take what Daniel said, what Yeshua said, what Paul said, what John said, what Peter said, if you combine them, you know that the end of all things is at hand. So for that reason, we don't admit of anything for even a moment because our life is beyond us. Number eight, pray towards, you know, something important. Pray forward. In other words, while in number seven, we're praying that the church will be rapture ready, the reality is that there are many who miss the rapture. Anywhere between 25 to 50% of the body today will miss the rapture because they either be caught up in offenses, they'll be caught up in politics, caught up in a thousand and one things, and the trumpet will sound, they will know it. But the Bible teaches that there is hope. The Bible teaches that there is hope for them. You see, uh, the, the graciousness and mercy of Elohim cannot be fathomed. That's why it's so important that we learn to ask the Lord, give us a little bit of that to your merciful heart. The Lord has still made provision that when the church is raptured, a man of sin manifests, begins to rule the world, he'll come against two people, Israel, the great tribulation. He wants to destroy Israel totally because when he goes to defy their temple and say, I am your Elohim, I made it possible for you to build, I gave you peace, they say, no, we have an Elohim is in heaven. And he'll get angry to destroy Israel. The other people who seek to destroy are the Christians who were left behind, who didn't make the rapture. He wants to destroy them, and so you will no longer be able to just go to church, carry your Bible. No, you'll be hiding because any neighbors, friends, family will tell against you in order to curry favor with government. And so we got to start now to pray, Lord, but eventually those who be left behind, please let them not go and kill themselves and go to hell forever. Give them the grace to remember these teachings, like the teachings we've done on the you know, on the book of Revelation, chapter 7 shows you clearly the innumerable number of people who will make it. Revelation 20 speaks about it. Another plus in the Holy Scriptures in Revelation tells us about the tribulation era saints. So we need to pray enough prayer for them to be able to get it right and make it. Then number nine, disaster relief. For all the world, one of the disaster relief is the war against COVID-19. So we're going to pray for degradation and elimination of coronavirus. It doesn't matter the nation where you are. But there are also some issues for different nations. South Africa, they have issues of corruption and issues of racial tension. Nigeria has issue of corruption, an issue of tribalism, an issue of militant Islam. Now you go to Ghana, another set of issues. Liberia, another set of issues. The South Sudan flood all issues don't ever come to the place where you are unconcerned about issues in your nation. You can have gun and knife crime in your city, you're unconcerned because nothing has happened to your own children. You got to pray, you got to guard, not just guard them, but you got to pray that the source that the angels of the Lord, the time has come when the Lord can send legions of angels to go and deal with issues that governments cannot deal with. When the church begins to operate in this dimension of supernaturality, of faith, then the church can literally define everything in the earth realm through prayer and spiritual warfare. And I won't say this to you, the time has come for our faith to be let loose, to come to the place where, literally speaking, the word impossible disappears from our dictionary. And I want to encourage you, if the Lord is calling you to be part of this cabinet, you know what? Go to Facebook, type prayer and spiritual cabinet for. Join the one for your nation. If you can't find it, put your name on the thread. He'll say, can't be in for that. Be available. Things are being set up. We have a competent ground troop. Oh, Prophet Loma, Adna, Ahama, who's going to direct things so that, you know, we can just stay on the role of visionaries. She has the capacity with those assisting her to ensure that this vision is implemented the way it is seen. So, brothers and sisters, 
we have given you these seven videos, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, uh, Sunday, no, sorry, Thursday too, and then this one, these seven videos are to equip you to know what to do. They'll be available in the prayer and spiritual cabinets of the various nations, and we urge you, don't be too much in a hurry, study them. And then there are short, 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 short presentations of the purpose of the cabinets. Read them, and when you read them, say, I subscribe to or I buy into it. Read those things, watch the videos, you'll be well equipped. Let's not be in a rush and mess up things. Please don't go into the cabinet to post things, post prayer requests. Pro no, leave those things for other groups. This one is going to be only prayer for nations. I want to thank Lord for Apostle Janita Sykes, who has found out the list of people in authority in the United States and posted it. So if you find those in your nation, you can put it. But in the UK, we're dealing with it because of the GDPR rules. We're dealing with it. It's going to go to the intercessors privately. Ireland, you're going to do so. Italy, other nations, let's all combine. This is the Lord's doing. This is his priority for now. If we do this, evangelism, there will be an explosion. Our power of Holy Spirit, there will be a final visitation. All the things the Lord promised is going to come because the church will be in prayer. Not just in prayer, aligned properly to pray in faith. We want to thank the Lord for you. I want to say this to you. If you have any questions, drop it on the thread. We will, by the grace of the Lord, attend to them. We'll go through and we're going to pray right now. Father in heaven, raise your hand to the Lord. Father, we lift up every brother, every sister before you. Bring us to that place where your grace is sufficient for us. Bring us to the place where we understand your kingdom. We walk in your kingdom truth and the present truth of your kingdom. Father, that your church will be free of all the things, the no titles that have mottled up the, the, the religious church. Let the kingdom church walk in that connectivity and unity. Walk in the holiness and righteousness of, your, of, of the blood of the Lamb. Walk in the power of Holy Spirit. Walk in the power of prayer and spiritual warfare, enforcing the ordinance of the kingdom over the natural realm. Like just, just Joshua was able to tell the sun to stand still and the, and the moon to stand still until he finished your assignment. Elijah was able to say to the rain, stop till I finish my assignment. And when he finished, he said, come down. Lord, we pray that your people begin to be manifest in this way. And the people of the world who wouldn't have believed, let them see your finger and let them bow and believe about who you are and in the midst of your people and know that truly the kingdom is within them. Have your way, O Lord. We exalt you, we magnify you. Lay hold on everyone and use us. Make us flaming sorts of fire and release your angels to minister to your people so that your work can be finished. In Yeshua Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And now before we leave, we want to say this to you by the grace of the Lord. Next week will be the Youth Sunday in our eyes. Please, we invite you to come on Facebook Live on our page from 2 p.m. London time. Get your children. Come and inspire your children. Let your children see Children, from opening prayer, all through praise, worship, all, you know, school of life, you know, the message, everything will be the young people. From young to, 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 to teenagers, everything will be them from beginning to the end. So invite your young people next week, bring them along, those who want to challenge, those who want to empower, let them see what the Lord will do through our next generation and by the grace of the Lord, let your people be inspired to see what you can do. And if you need help, by the grace of the Lord, we can assist you. Before I leave, I want to say this. Apostle Fred Harris, elder at the gate of International Missions Fellowship, and one of the you know, chairman of the advisory council and trustee, a member of Global Governing Council, who just was informed before, you know, a few hours ago, that his wife's uh, mom passed on, you know, and I'm going to, we're going to call him this evening to commiserate with him. Please, if you're part of International Ministers Fellowship, to reach out to him, offer a word of condolence, a word of encouragement. Just stretch out your arms around them. We are family. And we, we bear with one another. Okay? May the Lord bless you. Thank you, Destiny and Elect, for serving the body and serving us. Thank you.